Please take your seats now and join me in a round of applause for our Institute of Politics student leader, Nia Warren. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nia Warren. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm studying government and African-American studies, and I'm also a member of the JFK Junior Forum. Um, and I'm especially interested in how politics can address racial inequities that continue to pervade our society today. The COVID-19 pandemic, which laid bare many of the existing racial inequities in the US and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement has attracted renewed interest in the conversation about one way that politics can be used to address racial inequality reparations. So tonight I'm honored to introduce Professor Cornell William Brooks, Professor Linda J. Bilmez, who will discuss with us today the case for government provided repertory compensation to black Americans. Professor Brooks is a civil rights attorney and ordained minister who currently serves as a professor at Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Divinity School. Brooks also served as the 18th president of the NAACP from 2014 to 2017, where he led the NAACP in planning demonstrations and securing a string of legal victories advancing racial justice. Alongside Professor Brooks, we also have Professor Bilmez, a leading expert in budgetary and public finance issues. Professor Bilmez is a senior lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and a researcher focusing on budgeting and public administration in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Professor Bilmez is also the originator of the idea for this much needed report on reparations that we will be discussing today. Together, Professor Brooks and Professor Bilmez conducted a groundbreaking study that argues the US government is fiscally and morally responsible for the compensation of black Americans for centuries of economic and social injustice. I'm very excited to welcome Professor Brooks and Professor Vilmez to the forum, and I'm looking forward to the conversation ahead. Our moderator tonight is award-winning veteran journalist, culture critic, and thought leader, Deborah D. Douglas. She's the co-editor of The Emancipator, a collaboration between the Boston Globe opinion team and Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research. And before we welcome our guest, one note on our upcoming schedule. On Tuesday, February 22nd at 6 p.m., we hope you'll all join us here for another forum on the 2022 midterm elections, who controls Congress and the ideologies of the parties. IOP resident fellow and executive Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal, Jerry Sai will host a conversation on the political landscape of our country with prominent Democratic and Republican Party pollsters, John Anzalone and Tony Fabrizio. Now, please give a round of applause to Professor Linda Bilmez and Professor Cornell Williams Brooks and Deborah Douglas. <laughs> so let's get down to it. <laughs> um, I heard you say this on a, on a, on a podcast and I wanted to uh, see if you could drill down for us. You said, the obvious is hidden in plain sight. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, let me just begin with a word of appreciation to um, IOP, the leadership, the students, and everyone gathered here for this important conversation. So w when I made the point about the obvious being hidden in plain sight with respect to reparations, I was basically making the point that for many people across our country, we understand reparations to be exceptional aberrational, special, rare, instead of regular and routine. Well, what I mean by that, and what this paper demonstrates is that when we think about repertory compensation, the notion of the government recognizing a harm and compensating people and communities for it, this is routine. It is not aberrational, it is not exceptional, it is in fact uh, not rare. So in the public consciousness and in public memory, we think about uh, 40 something, th 42,000 Japanese Americans interned in World War II, and we think about them being compensated, or a relative handful of black folks who uh, suffered in terms of the massacre at Rosewood in Florida. But when we think about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, programs to the tune of millions and billions every day Reparations, to the extent they're represented as repertory compensation, is in fact commonplace, regular, routine. Excellent, thank you for going through those categories of reparations. 
But by now, I, I'd like to know, how does restorative justice and reparations connect? And that's for either of you, or both. Well, um, I serve as the United States member of the, the United Nations Committee of Experts. And um, the United Nations has done, since 2008, has done some work on this issue and has issued a, a series of categories of um, what reparations are. And to summarize, their categories are restitution, which is to restore people to their previous uh, condition before a harm occurred, compensation, if it's not possible to restore, uh, rehabilitation, satisfaction and dignity, and guarantees of non-repetition. Now, um, what we found in the United States is that there is a social norm of focusing on one or two of these categories, but certainly on compensation and rehabilitation. And by social norm, we mean something that is not only when you look at the, not only an everyday normal occurrence, but in the definition of social norm, there is this idea of oughtness, that it should be done. And so we find that there is this idea in the social norm in the United States that if A, then B. If there is a harm, then we provide some compensation to the person who has been harmed, regardless of where that harm came from, when the harm occurred, et cetera. And as a result of this, we found hundreds of programs in which people are provided with what we call reparatory compensation, that is compensation that helps repair their harm, not full restitution, but reparatory compensation for people who are affected by trade agreements that interferes with their livelihood, by agricultural um, activities, you know, pests or predators or weather that interferes with growing of crops. People are compensated for floods, for weather disasters, for terrorism, for vaccine injuries, for other kind of medical injuries, for workplace injuries, for pretty much anything that happens if they're exposed to pesticides, to radiation, to toxins. We have programs for sardine fishermen, we have programs for Christmas tree farmers. We have a wide range of programs that helps to provide some compensation when people's livelihood are harmed. These programs typically extend to the individuals and to their uh, next of kin and their descendants. So this is what we mean by this. And what we found is that, to answer your question, there is a connection between the concept of reparations that we are talking about with regard to the harms that black Americans have sustained and what we do in many, many other areas where there are harms. Well, I wanna talk a little, I'm really fascinated by the Christmas tree farmers, I just have to say. <laughs> but I wanna back up a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about, about what this connects to, um, the end of enslavement did mm. that but it did it ever really end mm. Mm. <laughs> this is incredibly important for us to to appreciate the reason being is that there are some threshold objections to reparations the notion that slavery was a long time ago so when senator mitch mcconnell said why reparations it happened so long ago uh secondly this notion that reparations would be impossible to administer, administratively speaking, and that it costs too much. So going to the question of slavery being long ago and whether or not it ended. So at the point in time in which the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1863, the 13th Amendment, 1865, there were 3.9 to 4 million African Americans, black people who were enshackled and enslaved. But in the wake of that, we saw the slave codes morph into the black codes, rendering a whole class of people debt slaves. That system of peonage, debt slavery, did not end until the opening week of World War II. 
And so the point being here is, well, what were the numbers? So at least 800,000 people who were enslaved as, in terms of the convict leasing system. Millions of people who were forced to work on farms and work in places that not of their choosing. And so the point being is you go for, from 3.9 to 4 million to 800,000 millions who were forced into debt slavery and debt labor. And then of course on the backs of that we have the uh, system of mass incarceration that we see today that is not unrelated to the slave codes and the black codes. So when we talk about whether or not slavery ever ended, this is not a matter of a series of disconnected tweets, if you will, but rather interrelated chapters in a long-running saga, the length of which is like Tolstoy's War and Peace, right? This continues to this very day, so you can't have a, rep a conversation about repertory compensation without appreciating the interconnectedness of the harms. And that's what the paper does. We, we look at the degree to which the, the harms, racial harms, are in fact interconnected, intergenerational, additive, and compounding. One stacks upon the other, but the harms in fact compound. And we see that in terms of the economic impact, in housing, uh, voting, criminal justice, violence, uh, all the categories that we call a taxonomy. That's massive. So I would like for you to dive into this tax taxonomy a little bit more and uh, describe how the, the study is uh, organized as a roadmap to help us read and absorb and, um, and activate the recommendations and, mm. and your findings. So my colleague Linda is pointing to a picture that was drawn by one of our students, uh, which you will see uh, above you. So if you think about uh, slavery and its vestiges as a tree with the roots um, extending into the ground of American history prior to 1865, 1863, uh, the roots extending into the trunk of the tree and into the limbs from the past into the present into the future. We see categories of harms related to violence, criminal, legal, uh, uh, should say the criminal justice system, uh, housing, employment, wages, enfranchisement. So seven different categories, but what's important here is look at the ways in which they interact. So in other words, think about Ida B. Wells, the, the anti-lynching champion. When she writes an editorial while she's away from Memphis, her building is burned to the ground. Three of her colleagues are killed. The city of Memphis is decimated. People flee, so there's economic damage. There's damage, there's damage to the body, there's racial trauma. The point being here is these harms are connected. It's not just housing, not just employment, not just violence, not just uh, disenfranchisement, but these harms are very much interconnected. In many of the ways, in much of the ways that you see uh, the roots connected to the trunk of the tree, connected to the branches, extending upward. And what's powerful about this paper is we look at the categories of these harms, we relate them one to another as a matter of law, as a matter of policy, as a matter of history, but also looking at the economic impact. And let us note this, no matter what price tag you put on it, it's an understatement of the harm. It's so funny that you should uh, mention Ida B. Wells because yeah. I was talking to her great-granddaughter, Michelle Duster, and she was saying, Deb, you know, think of how the world would look differently if my grandmother's operation would have been able to become a Hearst Publishing. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with me. So uh, in talking about your study, you've, uh, you referred to a phrase called everyday reparations. So is this one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it? Linda, can you unsee it? <laughs> I, think, um, it's, I think it's very hard to unsee it. And everybody who we have, we've given this paper and th this um, address to a number of different audiences now. And typically people think, oh yeah, I can think of another program. And uh, oh yeah, that's what the military does. <laughs> and I mean, people, it tends to make people people's minds percolate once they start widening the definition of reparations. And we have examples that we think about that are very important, then very important reparations to Japanese Americans, reparations 
for the Holocaust, reparations now in Colombia with the FARC. Sure. I mean, there are better known um, examples, but those are not the only examples. So, for example, um, everyone probably in this room has benefited from this kind of social norm over the last two years. As the COVID pandemic arrived, the first thing that happened was that the government stepped in. And the government stepped in to try and support individuals with payments, to try and support small businesses with payments. I mean, the government did many things wrong, but what it did following the traditional norm was it paid out compensation to people to try to maintain their livelihood. Now, um, uh, sorry, Deborah, what, what was the question? <laughs> Well, <laughs> can you can you unsee it? And I guess my follow up is that, or can you talk more about the juxtaposition between reparations being routine or radical? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce mm -hmm. uh, d and during the Clinton administration, and so I administered many of these programs, but I didn't really see them through this lens. But now that I am seeing programs through this lens. When I go through government programs, I see that many of them, particularly when I look at the text of what they are intended to do, are very similar in spirit to the idea of reparations. So for example, you can look at a program which um, has provided cash benefits, rehabilitation, job retraining to hundreds of thousands of Americans who have been involved in or exposed to the nuclear program whether they are employees or the people who lived near the nuclear weapons program or they were contractors who delivered stuff to it. It was a very, very significant program with many billions of dollars spent. And when you look at the text of what the description is, it describes the incredible sacrifices that these people have made to bring America's nuclear program into being, the incredible suffering that people have suffered as a result of being exposed to it, one way or another, the uh, fact that people through no fault of their own happen to live in a place near an installation and so on and so forth. I mean, it, that, that is the way that the thing is written. And um, th you know, the second thing that, that um, in terms of un, not unseeing it, I mean, we, we see this is that not only do we look, and maybe we, we should, I have um, on what we call the, um, the wow slide because th this is just a snapshot of some of the programs that the government, uh, through which the government paid reparatory compensation. And the rep there are many, and in most cases, when you look carefully at the program, you will find a number of sub-programs. So for example, we there are a large number of programs compensating for anything that could possibly happen to the 100 major crops uh, grown in the United States. But then when you look carefully, there's another program for anything that could possibly happen. So it's not just weather or disasters, but it could be diseases, it could be errors in the way the things were planted, it could be things like predators coming in, it could be uh, toxins coming in from some, some place nearby, wh whatever it is. There's another program for those crops like Christmas trees or ginseng that are not in the top 100 uh, crops consumed in America. When you look at the um, vaccine, just to mention something close to everyone's heart, mm -hmm. when you look at injuries due to vaccines, the United States has had a program since 1988 that provides compensation for anybody uh, who is harmed by taking a vaccine that is recommended by the CDC. Um, there is another program for, uh, that is in, put in place in 2010 for those who are injured or harmed and their families by anything that is uh, not just a vaccine, but any other kind of medical device or medical intervention that is government approved. We know the Food and Drug Administration approves these things. And even though obviously they don't do that with the intent 
of harming people, some people will occasionally be, be harmed. And we have paid out, for example, in the 1988 um, Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund, more than $5 billion on that fund. Now, another very important point in looking at all of these programs and so forth is the fact that there is a very wide range of ways in which they are funded and paid for. So, for example, every vaccine given in this country, every single vaccine, uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturers have to pay a 75 cent excise tax. And that excise tax goes into a fund, and that is the fund that is used for the payouts for those who are harmed um, through vaccines. Uh, similarly, every single barrel of crude oil pays a nine cent tax, the, um, which, and that goes into a fund which is used in the case of oil spills to compensate people who are harmed through oil spills, and so on and so forth. That's awesome. So uh, talk to us a little bit about your shift in perspective. What happened? Something happened that forced you to shift the, shift the way that you look at this. Um, my, my friend Jenny Mansbridge mm -hmm. talks about this sort of aha moment yes. that women had. She talks about it happening in Me the too. 60s. <laughs> <laughs> she said in the 60s there was some moment at which um, she was thinking, gosh, I have to do all the laundry and do all the things with the kids, and I'm also doing this job, and da-da-da-da-da-da. It's like, hang on, you know, wha how come I'm doing all this? How, mm -hmm. how come he isn't doing this? Which kind of sparked the women's movement. Now, I think that for many people in this country, the murder of George Floyd was this, was a moment that changed the way a lot of us think about a lot of things. I mean, the, after George Floyd was murdered, there were 2,000, um, th there were protests in 2,000 cities and towns. There were 25 million people, according to the Kaiser Foundation, who protested in this country. There were protests in 60 cities around the world. And so certainly for me, um, I began to think about things in a new, as I um, had my own discernment, I tried to think about things in a different way and that, that made me, me um, think about, rethink um, some of the, these these programs and what they were intended to do. Thank you for that. Deborah, my, yes. My, we point to an aha moment um, more than a century ago. Okay. Right. So let's think about uh, another woman. Yes. Uh, we think about Callie House, who was born uh, into slavery uh, as an infant. Uh, after after slavery ends. She becomes a laundress, as it were. Um, she lived in a state of Tennessee, and she formed what became the first grassroots reparations movement in the country. So in terms of a woman having an aha moment, she notes, and it, it, this goes to, to Linda's earlier point, she sees Civil War veterans being compensated based upon the length of their service. She then calls for the creation of a compensation program for ex-slaves, creates an organization called the Ex-Slave Mutual Benefit Pension Association to the tune of 300,000 members. This is before the formation of the NAACP, chapters all across the country. Now note this parenthetically. Uh, you recall Edmund Pettus as yes. in the Edmund Pettus Bridge? Edmund Pettus, Senator Edmund Pettus, supported reparations. Why? Because he thought that this would, be, this would be money that would end up in the hands of white landowners in the South. Callie House is aware of this. She creates an, this organization to press for reparations. Not only that, going to Linda's point about an excise tax, she notes that the tax imposed on cotton harvested by slaves could be used to fund reparations. The point being is this aha moment, both in terms of a funding stream and in terms of this norm of compensating people for harms, Civil War veterans, uh, former slaves. 
this was, this was not something of recent creation. This goes back a ways. And so the point being here is there's a, there's a historicity here and a power here. And so this notion, going back to your point about a reparations regular or routine, was it radical? I said, it, what was, it said, was it radical or, or routine? Was it radical uh, in, in the 1800s? Was it radical in the early, early 1900s? This notion of compensating people for harms um, by the government. So let's talk about making reparations now normative. Could you dive into that for us? I think w one of the things that's incredibly important for us to appreciate is when we consider the, the objections to reparations, namely uh, impossibility. It's impossible to administer too long ago. Slavery happened then. We're, we're over that now. Mm -hmm. And this notion that the cost is too high. When we look at the programs in the audit of the paper, all the programs covered, we discover a couple of things. One, the government has some proficiency in determining harm, uh, costing out harm, with a wide variety of claimants and victims. Um, and not only that, the government has some proficiency in um, responding to harms and the descendants of those harms. And so when we talk about normalizing reparations, it has everything to do with looking at operational precedent, looking at a societal norm, looking at what has already been done. So we know that the government can do it. We know that slavery didn't happen so long ago and in terms of its vestiges and aftermath. And lastly, we understand that it can be paid for. Why? because we have all of these programs to the tune of millions, billions, even trillions. And when we get to veterans, right, uh, we, we can talk about that. The point being here is part of what we have to do here is get past what I call a, an asymmetrical evidence uh, uh, burden, asymmetric uh, evidential burden, which is to say that when it comes to black people, you know, reparations are aberrational, exceptional, rare, unusual. But when we look at the history, we look at the fiscal precedent, precedent, that's not the case. And so if we put these harms on the same plane as others, we're in the position of talk, having a rational, thoughtful conversation about that which is normal, regular, and routine. That sounds really logical, but how do you sell that in this divisive environment that we're operating in? Go back to Japanese Americans, both in the first instance and the second instance. When Japanese Americans sought to get uh, reparations for their harm in the first instance, mm -hmm. um, they got a pittance relative to the harm. In the second instance, in the late 80s, um, they got more. But they got it through uh, a legislative campaign, storytelling, field hearings. In other words, we have to connect the narrative to uh, that which uh, is, um, is economic, uh, the morals and the money. And so when you look at that campaign, it had everything to do with storytelling and looking at the harms and costing out the harms. You look at Rosewood, you see a similar phenomenon. The point being is, with, with reparations in terms of black Americans, have there been field hearings? Have we costed this out? Have we had that conversation? I think the answer to that is no, but we can. Okay. Um, at the risk of triggering you, will paying these reparations hurt? Uh, uh, Colleagues, th 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 this is a question that Deborah knows does trigger me. <laughs> um, so this, this notion that um, pursuing reparations being harmful, being divisive. You know, when we look at the historical examples, um, this is not fair. This, this whole notion that if you ask for reparations, the mere asking is in fact divisive and harmful. That's a little like saying, that a, a patient who, who has suffered from some illness, some disease, some injury, is in fact harming the doctor, harming the nurse, harming the hospital by pointing out the fact that they are in fact harmed, point one. Point two here is that it is healing, right? We go back to the, the, the etymological uh, origins of, of reparations. It is healing and repairing to have this conversation. And there are examples around the world uh, in terms of Colombia, in terms of South Africa, uh, in terms of Germany, where the acknowledgement of the harm, an apology for the harm, or uh, compensation for the harm, does advance uh, healing and repair. So um, talk to us a little bit more about the, the, pr the underlying principles for um, reparatory compensation. 
And, um, and also, can we, can we get as far as an apology? Well, um, I, think that the, I think that the mood is shifting in favor of reparations. I mean, looking at a UMass Amherst um, overall poll uh, last year, for example, 57% um, of Americans aged 18 to 29 believe that we should um, pay reparations. And um, more than uh, about 40% of those aged 30 to 54, which is more than double what it was um, 15 years earlier. And 64% of Democrats, 63% of Biden voters support reparations. So we've seen in the same way that we have seen a change, you know, enormous change in attitudes toward things like gay marriage over the last 20 years. I mean, there has been a significant shift, um, the polling indicates, in favor of this. But when you look at having started my life as a pollster, um, the most important questions are always why do people not support it? And the, the largest reasons for not supporting ref reparations, the single largest one is um, that it's too difficult to administer. And part of the purpose of going through our audit of all of these programs is to say that actually what the government does every day is it figures out eligibility and administration criteria for, for dozens and dozens of programs. This actually the government does this a lot. This is like what, if you look through the Department of Labor, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, all of these agencies and every other agency in government is doing this kind of eligibility um, and administration, um, uh, which is not to say they're doing it perfectly or doing it super efficiently, but they, they have a lot of experience with this. I mean, the second um, issue is that it's too hard to place a monetary value on such great suffering. And um, this goes to your question bef about the, the concept of reparations. I mean, the United States norm is not, has not been to repair people to the, to the, the condition they were before the harm. And I think that that is probably far beyond my ability to even imagine here. What the government does is it provides some compensation for people to help restore their, um, particularly related to their livelihood. And that is uh, the kind of thing that is directly related to the wealth gap, um, the education gap, and the other kinds of very tangible gaps that we see um, between black Americans and white Americans today. So our friend, um, Professor Sandy Darity, um, has done in his book, From Here to Equality, has estimated the wealth gap. And so, for example, the median um, white household, uh, this is the median, that's, that's not the average, this is the middle one, uh, has a wealth of $188,200, and the median black household has a wealth of $24,020. If, if you look at the, the average, it's, it's a much greater gap. But just thinking about that gap, which is about a $5 trillion gap, I mean, that is not, um, that is the way economists think about it. For almost anybody earning whose wealth is $24,000, there will be a positive multiplier to the economy for, for adding and investing in such households. And this is the kind of thing the government does across the board. It's just that you know there are not very many programs that have been targeted around this issue. Um, just just the 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 third um, issue that people say uh, is a reason not to have um, reparations for Black Americans is that it's too expensive, and. That, I think, is in a way where I have been most intrigued by our audit of the programs because we have found quite a number of different ways that these things are funded. So there are three main ways that they are funded. I mean, one is through these excise taxes, so many, many programs. And one could imagine an excise tax, for example, on ins insurance companies that uh, discriminated for a small amount. I mean, these are tiny amounts, you know, nine cents on a barrel of 
of crude oil. Crude oil is, costs $100 um, dollars a barrel. You're talking about $0.09 cents here. So um, you could imagine on, on banks that wouldn't lend to black Americans, on insurance companies that wouldn't lend. I mean, yes, they pass those costs on to the rest of us. But, I mean, these kind of excise taxes are used across the board for many, many kinds of harms. I mean, the second um, major area that is used is um, uh, subsidized insurance. So um, you have subsidized crop insurance, flood insurance, a whole range of other kinds of disaster insurance, earthquake insurance, and so on, which insurance companies actually won't underwrite, and so the government subsidizes it extensively. Some of these programs are not even very well designed. But this kind of insurance, I, I'm sure that in this room of students, if I were teaching the class, we could within a couple of hours come up with a couple of ways of designing insurance programs that could help to provide insurance that would mitigate against discriminatory um, practices, for example, in housing and education. Um, the third uh, is um, various forms of government seeded trust funds that grow over time, um, usually partly through government money and partly through a variety of uh, charitable and um, public-private partnerships. So when you look at all of the programs on my wow list there and all the ones in our um, spreadsheet that we have, we see that hundreds of billions of dollars, in total trillions of dollars, have been spent and a lot of that money has come through a variety of sources and funding mechanisms. So I think that part of the purpose of our project here is to say, you know, the government knows how to administer these kind of programs. The government actually um, knows how to think about how we finance these things. And this is not really, I mean, it, it's not only not impossible, but I mean, this is what we do. This is routine. And this is why Cornell likes to say this is routine, not radical. Right, right. Yeah, but can, can I note this? Well, yes. Can I just let, let no. the students know that uh, we are going to be taking questions and one or two questions or comments. And um, so you're invited to come up to the, the microphones here and up there if you have some questions. And of course, we mean questions, you know, the thing that ends in a question mark. <laughs> and, um, and I'll circle back to you in just a second. Sorry about that. You well, were saying. I just wanted to note this. So having led the NAACP where we sue all kinds of private actors on a regular basis, but also having served as a trial attorney in the Department of Justice, where you mm -hmm. sue companies, banks, uh, housing providers for discrimination. When the government sets up uh, a settlement, they often essentially impose a tax on the defendant. They create programs to not only end the discrimination, but provide compensation for the victims. These settlement agreements are approved by courts. And so the point being is this is true administratively, it's true bureaucratically, it's, in, it's true in terms of federal budgets, but it's also true in terms of federal settlements. The point being is this norm, societal norm, mm -hmm. uh, is, rec is recognized as uh, a matter of legal practice on, on a daily basis. And so this is, uh, it is routine, it's, it's not radical. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to surface as my last question, the, the example of the GI Bill that we talked about mm -hmm. and the fact that there's a, there's a real time application uh, connected to that bill. So why don't you uh, start Cornell and I can sure. chime in. Mm -hmm. Sure. And you might want to see, if we can see yeah. the slide. Um, yeah, there's a picture. Slide. If you look above you, there's a picture of Sergeant Isaac Woodard Jr. who hailed from my home state of South Carolina. He served his country honorably. He was awarded a number of medals. He returns home and uh, gets on a bus headed toward his hometown. Uh, he's accosted, uh, literally, by state police who pull him from the bus and literally blind him. Uh, as a consequence of this horrific crime, it leads to an outcry across the United States and it leads to uh, President Truman's executive order desegregating the military, but it highlights, it highlights the ways in which black veterans um, who 
uh, served, represent uh, 8% of, of the total, um, they did not receive housing benefits in the main, did not receive educational benefits in the main. And what we have uh, found in the, and lived up in the paper is this has an intergenerational uh, impact in terms of racial wealth. If you can imagine not being, having the, the opportunity, or I should say having a benefit in terms of being able to buy a house, but having that benefit denied. Uh, having the, others having the opportunity to go to college or university, to enter the professions, and having that opportunity denied. This has ripple effects across generations that can be felt to this very day. And Linda, if you can speak about the legislation that is uh, uh, in Congress as we speak. Um, this is a, a very, very important practical um, piece of legislation that is, that is an example of thinking about this in the way that we're talking about here. So um, in World War II, 1.2 million black Americans served in World War II. Um, that was 8% of the total uh, US troops. And the GI Bill was enacted in 1944, which provided educational benefits, uh, extremely subsidized home mortgages, and unemployment compensation for those veterans. That was in place until 1956. Um, 4.3 million uh, home mortgages were awarded through the GI Bill, including my father, who was a World War II veteran, who, who got his education on the GI Bill and, and bought a home on the GI Bill. And the GI Bill was almost impossible for black Americans, for black veterans to access. And this was through a combination of reasons. It was partly because by design, uh, the bill was administered by the states and many states, particularly the southern states, discriminated and did not allow any blacks to qualify for this bill. And at that point, 79% of black veterans um, hailed from the South. So you had 79% of the black veteran population who, who sort of off the bat didn't qualify for either the home mortgage or the educational benefits. But in addition to that, on the education side, I mean, those who could qualify were 95% um, of them were, were directed to the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, which at the time were very tiny and they didn't have the scale uh, or the programs or the fields of discipline to be able to provide um, an education for most of those who, who wanted to receive it. Uh, I, I, I just happened to be noting down the, the number of veterans from that war who, who, um, who did receive the GI Bill education bill produced 22,000 dentists, 67,000 doctors, 91,000 scientists, 238,000 teachers, 240,000 accountants, 450,000 engineers. Well, so you know, as an accountant, maybe we, we forget the accountants, but for everyone else, <laughs> you wonder, I mean, all of those black Americans were missing because if they were able to get an education, they weren't able to go to medical school or engineering school or whatever. Now, um, the, two, um, the two major drivers of wealth in America, the creators of wealth, are education and home ownership. And so this, led to, this was a middle century thing, which endured again through the Korean War in which another 500,000 black Americans served. And uh, what the um, GI Bill that our friends, Congressman Seth Moulton, Congressman Jim Clyburn, and Senator uh, Raphael Warnock have introduced, would extend the benefits of the GI Bill, the modern GI Bill, to the direct descendants of black World War II veterans who were denied those benefits. Now, right now, if you are a veteran, you know, I study veteran issues a great deal. There, the, the GI Bill is called the, the, the forever GI Bill. So if you are a veteran, you could just come back from Afghanistan. If you don't use your educational benefits, you can give it to your 
uh, spouse or your children. That is the way it works. Now what this bill would do is simply extend that back, except it would extend it to descendants of those who were denied on racial, um, on the basis of race, uh, the benefits who, who had been honorably discharged. So there is a lot to be said. I am very, very passionate on this issue, not because it is the only piece of legislation, but it is because it has been introduced recently. It was introduced on 11-11, uh, November 11th on Veterans Day, uh, just this past November. Uh, Cornell and I have been involved with this, and it is, a, it is an entirely consistent with the way we think about all other kinds of, of uh, reparatory compensation as a, um, as a, as, as one of the ways in which we can begin to address some of these issues. Thank you so much for that. It's, um, this bill is, uh, uh, illustratively speaking, a reparatory compensation or reparations bill where the class of, of claimants is discrete. And these are, their descendants are people we can see. So it's incredibly important. Last point here is, when Linda rattled off the number of physicians, the number of dentists, the number of engineers, let us note this. In terms of the HBCUs, you had Howard University Medical School and you had Meharry. Yep. That's it. Tuskegee, a veterinary school. The point being here is these schools, of which I'm a graduate, uh, were not unqualified. They were, in fact, subject to to laws that prohibited their growth, prohibited them from offering professional uh, education to their graduates. So there was a capacity issue, the number of veterans they were able to serve. There was a capacity issue, as in zero capacity, in terms of professional schools, having this intergenerational uh, consequence. And this bill re responds to those veterans uh, in terms of their descendants, and it illustrates what might be done. Great, thank you so much for that. So we can take some questions now. Uh, could you identify yourself and your university affiliation? My name is Peter Williams. I'm a fellow with Advanced Leadership Initiative. What I like about this conversation is it basically changes the narrative around reparations. It also gives, from my perspective, um, Professor Brooks, you know, in our community, we, we battle about reparations all the time, right? It gives us some tools from the grassroots perspective to start talking about reparations. And two things, there's two, my, what are the political implications, right? And in terms of pushing this through, remember Conyers had his bill that was there, is it, it's how do we one? How do we mainstream it, right? Get it on the caucus's radar screen, and two, every good idea around our liberation, there's a counter, right? What are the new counter arguments that you perceive since you kind of knocked a lot of that stuff out of the way in terms of the narrative change? Well, I, I just want to note this. Uh in terms of the counter arguments. So the counter arguments might be to what Linda has lifted up, uh, I, I think, well and discursively, exhaustively, is the notion that all of these programs have nothing to do with racial harms. Christmas tree farmers and, and uh, uh, subsidized insurance and whatnot. The, 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 what does that have to do with racial harms? But if you read the paper carefully, listen to and look at the wild slide, as it were, the numerosity of the programs, the breadth of the programs, illustrate the degree to which government can res respond to one, and two, that this is in fact normal, and it is inherently mainstream, right? So in other words, this is not on the margins. And so part of, the, part of this is a certain kind of analytic presumptiveness. We have to come to the table based upon the history, based upon the fiscal precedent, based upon the economics, and simply assert that this is right because we, there's an oughtness, uh, as Linda has, has lifted up, uh, history backs us, current federal practice backs us, and then part of this is storytelling. We, we, we need to be very clear about this. Uh, you know, Linda and I have talked about the fact that our paper is a combination 
of numbers and nouns, right? Uh, she's disproportionately responsible for numbers, and maybe I'm guilty of a few nouns and adjectives and adverbs. But the point being here is unless we tell the story in a way to put faces, right? So we, we started with Cali House because we want people to understand the excise, this notion of a tax on cotton, that this black woman back then mounted federal litigation in order to secure our reparations. So in other words, this has long been mainstream. We have to tell the story, get the story out into the, the public, use the field hearings, collect the data, and bring more people to the table. So in other words, I think this paper illustrates what can be done, and in so doing, it implies what ought to be done. Um, hearing at caucus weekend, one of the caucus weekends and having a conversation about rethinking preparation to get it out of the mainstream. Right. Uh, I asked my colleague, wouldn't you like to speak at that hearing and testify? That's a leading question. I, I will just say that um, I think w what we see is a very strong precedent in this country. I mean, for for both um, in some case in some small number of cases, race-based reparations, but for reparations in general, we don't see a precedent for the United States it, across any of these programs doing a uh, taking a great deal of um, of uh, responsibility or or apologies what we see is a certain level of or I should say not a great deal of taking accountability what you see is a kind of more um, pragmatic approach around providing reparatory compensation and so for example, I mean, I, yes, I am numbers person, guilty as charged, but thinking about the, the situation with a uh, large number, with the American Indian Trust Fund. And the American Indian Trust Fund situation where um, for in the 1880s, a number of American Indian um, tribes signed agreements uh, giving, uh, which gave the land use to the United States, but they retained the rights uh, to royalties on the, the mineral rights and use for grazing, hunting, drilling, mining, et cetera. The US was managing this for 100 years, uh, except it turned out that they weren't actually paying any money and the money disappeared. So in 2010, um, there was a settlement reached with the United States paying back $3.5 billion, which is only a fraction of all the money that was siphoned off and stolen, really. But um, what had been sought was a great deal of, of accountability and, and apologies. What, what was delivered was a financial settlement, partial settlement, but some settlement saying, okay, yes, we can understand, we've been able to track all of these things and we're gonna give back this amount of money. So I think that that is a starting point. That is a starting point, and there are many, many points of, uh, in, in starting with the uh, GI Bill that is actually just, just two months old, um, that could be places to begin requesting and demanding financial compensation for, very sp for, for a wide range of, of harms. This is not the only legislation where there were very significant harms to an identifiable group. Thank you for that. And thank you for your patience, young lady. Hi, my name is Ifaloa Adidiko, and I'm a first year at Harvard College. So looking in the future to the administration of these reparations, I'm wondering, wondering about the eligibility of the wording. Like this form is titled Reparations for Black Americans, but even the notion of Black Americans has different meanings. There are generational African Americans with direct ties to slavery, and like, for example, me, I'm a first generation African American who kind of, kind of indirectly and directly affected by um, modern day slavery practices. So we can admit that there are modern day slavery practices with a, which affect all black Americans. So my question is how you foresee the wording of these programs where they're actually actualized. Do you think these distinctions are necessary between black Americans when thinking about the demographics of those most affected by things like the wealth gap, home ownership and education? Or does this further stratify relationships between the categories of black, Af black Americans? I think so. Um, 
here's what I, I, I might suggest, that the, the what affects how we respond to the who, meaning the number of black Americans who have descendants who were enslaved. Uh, we have black Americans who, whose forebears hail from uh, the Caribbean. We have African Americans who, whose uh, forebears hail from the continent and elsewhere. And so it's very complicated and we don't want to be subject to the one drop rule, right? It, we're, we're aware of this notion, this notion that one drop of, of African blood, blood somehow taints you, right? But if you can imagine a variety of responses, a variety of programs, a variety of funding streams that respond to the diversity of those harms. Those folk who were whose forebears were enslaved long ago, but if you can imagine somebody like Harry Bel Belafonte or Sidney Poitier, whose forebears hail from the Caribbean, who was subject to Jim Crow discrimination. So what we tried to do in this paper is to look at the taxonomy of harms, an audit of programs, look at the funding streams, look at the possibility -ish challenge, impossibility argument, the cost argument, um, and, 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 and the normative argument, and respond to that. So I'd like to believe our paper posits the possibilities of a variety of responses without locking us into, at this juncture, like who gets what and uh, whose name is on the check, as it were. Is that responsive? That's great. Uh, sir, do you have a question? Yes, uh, good, e uh, good afternoon. I'm Jordan Jefferson. I'm an MPP2 student at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question, uh, do you think in our political climate, uh, do you think we will get representation for African Americans in the next 50 years? Also, what is the dollar amount, uh, according to your research, African Americans deserve? How soon, how much? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a dollar amount on your note card, Linda? Yeah, well, so, so the, I mean, our, our work, you know, sometimes the research that I do has to do with how big is it. So a lot of my work around the cost of the war has been sort of how much does it cost? I mean, here we have basically relied on the work of many other scholars uh, to, to um, who have, for various reasons, come up with ways of thinking about all of these compounding, ev evolving harms. So for example, uh, William Garrity estimates the wealth gap, which he sees as a proxy for, for hundreds of years of compounded harms at $11 trillion. Now, um, I don't know if that's the right n number or not, but he's a very respected economist and, and uh, you know, that, that, that's one way of thinking about it, the wealth gap. I mean, another way of thinking about it is thinking about many different kinds of harms. There are housing harms, and there are educational harms, and there are harms of insurance, and there are harms of health, and there are many criminal justice harms, and so on, and thinking about it more in terms of different um, categories of people being eligible for different types of programs. Now, that is the way, for example, in the um, veterans world, where there are 18 million veterans, veterans who have fought in different wars, veterans who have different kinds of disabilities, who have different kinds of needs, who have different types of um, um, situations in which they serve, you know, qualify depending on all different types of, of um, issues for a really wide range of different kinds of programs. But I mean, I think that we will probably we, we are hoping from this, uh, with this, to push the, push this discussion forward and to end the conversation that says, oh gosh, this, we just like, this is just like, you know, this is too big, we, we don't know how to do this, we don't know how to administer this, we, we don't even know how to begin to think about this, because we do. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, there's no guarantee that, um, I mean, in the, in the agreements with Native American tribes and in many, many others who have given good cause, 
whether they are uh, fishermen who've had their catch interfered, you know, due to oil spills, or whether they are uh, people who have, have uh, accidentally um, been impacted by really bad government trade deals. I mean, they would probably say that they haven't been given everything they were entitled to, but the government makes a start. And we have made a start across many, many areas, but not in not this area. Thank you, sounds Thank like you. a great question. Over here. Hi, I my, it, oh, did I miss you up there? Hi, my name is uh, Diego Garcia Bloom. I'm an MPP, an, a social change fellow at CPL. So my question is about the impact of reparations. Um, of course, the, the, the funds can be used to bridge all kinds of gaps that we have and reach parity and some outcomes. But it's also an opportunity to have some psychological healing in this country from generations of trauma and also maybe a turning point in how we, we have relations to our past here. And my question is, how does the messaging that come from the government through this have to be done in order to create that new atmosphere where we are reckoning in a social healing, a collective national healing that is, goes much more beyond you know, the numbers and figures? So Diego, I, I would just simply note this. If we look at some of the historical um, examples, so at least in the case of Japanese Americans, there was an apology with money. And the apology uh, in no way makes people whole, but it's an acknowledgement of, of the harm. And so while it's beyond the boundaries, I should say, the, the, the limits of, of this paper, I think an apology is, is, is essential here. We had the House of Representatives issued an apology for slavery, um, but the country needs to come to grips with that, so number one. Number two, I want to give you an example. Uh, there was Henrietta Wood who sued uh, her captors in, uh, after the Civil War. She received a, a, a legal award of $20,000 or, or so. But here's what happened to her family. As a consequence of her suing her captors, who literally took a free black woman into slavery, took her down to Texas, she had to wait for the duration of the Civil War, and then she sues her captors. That $20,000 led to her son attending the uh, predecessor to Northwestern University Law School. It led to her uh, children and grandchildren entering the professional class and lifted the economic trajectory of that family. Now, I would imagine there was an economic shift in status, but the fact that the court recognized what happened to her and held those who were responsible um, responsible. In this country, this is not a matter of assignment of blame, but it is a matter of assignment of responsibility, acknowledgement of harm, and I would argue that this contributes to the healing of the country. In other words, rather than all of us collectively engaging in self-denial, right, as we talk about racial reckoning without having engaged in a historical reckoning, this is a matter of collective national civic self-deception. I think it would take us a long way in terms of an apology, recognizing the harm, and the money is a is a instrument for repairing and healing. Now, of course, none of that is in the table of contents of this paper, because beyond the, the, the contours of this paper. We're going to wrap up soon, but we were going to take a question from this gentleman. Hi, I'm Clive. I'm a first year at um, Harvard College. Thank you for joining us in this uh, forum and highlighting a very pertinent issue. I'm wondering if there are any comparably sized compensation programs today or historically that would serve as an example uh, that could work for a black American reparations program, uh, since there are like 41 million black Americans compared to 17 million veterans and 2 million farms. Um, do you have an idea of how those programs are streamlined in a way that effectively and practically com compensates those victims? And would this work in a hypothetical reparations program for black Americans? Thank you. Well, I mean, I think that's a very good question. 
there are some large scale programs that the government administers. And one of the largest scale programs is um, for veterans uh, overall. I mean, we have uh, just through the, as, as I mentioned, I mean, just through the first 10 years of the GI Bill, uh, there were 4.3 million mortgages awarded by the VA. Now, right now, the um, over the last 20 years, I mean, the the um, there have been about five million Americans who fought in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. About half of those, or about 2.5 million Americans, have already been awarded lifetime benefits um, for something that happened to them. I mean, we run a nine million person veterans health care uh, establishment. We spend $250 billion a year on the VA. I mean, that's is a very, very large scale program. But even if we look through some of the programs that have happened, particularly around wartime and war mobilization, I mean, these are large scale programs. And we spend over $300 billion um, on the initial GI Bill in World War II in today's money. And this is a big, big program dealing with 16 million people. So I think that the government is capable of doing something at scale. Um, we run, for example, every 10 years, and this is not a reparations program, but we run the census, which involves a peacetime mobilization of 900,000 people, you know, hiring 900,000 people, sending pe people out to, to do the count, you know, to every single square block across the entire country, every rural community, every Aleutian Island. I mean, these are massive scale programs. I mean, I think that because of the fact that we, we have, uh, when we think about the um, number of African Americans in this country who would qualify for you know, one of many different kinds of programs, you have many different ages, many different types of, of um, programs that might be designed. So it wouldn't necessarily be one monolithic thing. But I, you know, despite the fact that the government is not always super efficient at everything it does, there's no reason to think the government isn't able to manage a program of this scale. Right. And would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I, I just would uh, want to underscore here that it, it's, not, it's simply not a matter of um, the height or the amount, but breadth, right? So to the extent that we already engage in repertory compensation in terms of health-related harms, vaccines, uh, housing-related harms, in terms of um, uh, homes uh, in a, a floodplain, uh, that we look at harms related to communities in terms of military-based closures, the breadth of harm speaks to also the height of our height of harm in terms of our ability to compensate, our rec ability to recognize harm, ability to sort victims, uh, sort claimants. That all speaks to this whole notion of, of impossibility, i.e. our being unable to do it. So it's not merely a matter of unable to pay or inability to pay, but also this presumed notion of this inability to administer. We. I believe have demonstrated that those arguments frankly just don't stand up. And that then creates the possibility for us as a country to have a real conversation about our past, our present, and our future. Wonderful, thank you. I would like to thank all of you for your time and attention this afternoon. And um, I would like to thank the Institute of Politics and you, Professor Billness, and you, Professor Brooks, for your insight intellect and heart for our people. Um, and as the co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator, where we're reimagining the nation's first radically abolitionist newspapers, I cannot wait to do what you already said we should do, and that's to tell the story. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.